The scripture reading for today comes from John 6, 41 through 59. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this the Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof, and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum.
John chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at verses 41 through 59. As I mentioned last week, my prayer for us is that we would not miss the understanding that is in the text and respond respectfully to the message which is called the message from the bread of life. And so at this point in the, in the message that the Lord Jesus Christ is giving, there comes another bit of, uh, I should say, some other people that get involved uh, in what's going on. Um, there's sort of an interruption caused by the arrival of some new people necessitating an end to the Lord's private words that we talked about to his disciples last week and a renewal of his controversy with the Jews over his claim to be the bread of life. And this section is taken up with uh, what we're calling the resentment concerning the bread of life message. Resentment concerning the bread of life message. Question is this, do you resent the bread of life message or do you rejoice in it? And so that's the question you have to ask yourself. And as you're listening to what God has to say, do I rejoice in the fact of this or do I resent it? You'll see in verse 41 there in your text that they start murmuring. They start murmuring against him. This is the Jews that start murmuring. We'll get to it next week, Lord willing, and it ends up his own disciples murmur against him. See, it's a hard thing to take the truth. It's a difficult thing. In fact, you have to take the truth in order to move where God wants you to go. And so... We're in a a situation here where the Lord has given a message. He's given a sermon. And he's watching literally many of them walk away. And so we're coming up on Resurrection Sunday next Sunday. And you say, man, this is Palm Sunday. This should be just awesome. You know, God's word is always awesome. And his message is always awesome. And you know what makes it even more awesome? Is when people respond instead of resent. When they respond to the gospel instead of resenting it. And saying, this is not for me, this is for someone else. Well, friend, it's for everyone. And everyone watch this individually. And you... You have to respond individually, and you either respond to it and rejoice, or you resent it, and you reject the very gospel that the bread of life is given. And so we said last week, you can bring someone to the table, and you can give them and offer them the bread of life, but they have to what? They have to eat it, and it's got to get in their gut and in their system for it to be any benefit to them. So we're going to see that played out right here. And he's going to talk about it right straight to us. Number one, as you take notes, I just want you to see there are two, there are reasons why they objected to the Lord. First of all, they're murmuring. They're murmuring. All right? There's two reasons why they objected. First is the preliminary reason. That's found in verses 41 and 42. The preliminary reason is right here. Here he was claiming to be the bread which came down from heaven, claiming in short to be from heaven, to be God himself. But how could that be? I mean, how could that be? I mean, that's that's totally impossible. All the folks that he's from, his hometown, he's come back, his hometown, his home group. How could that be? What do they say? They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? They murmured at him, John says. Interesting, that word for murmured is the same one used in the Septuagint for the murmuring of the children of Israel in the wilderness. The very same word. Oh, by the way, God wasn't pleased when they murmured in the wilderness. They spent 40 years going around and around and around, trying to get where he told them to go. He'd cleared the way, and they still couldn't get there. Why? Because they were murmuring. 
Do you murmur? Is that something you find yourself often doing? Is murmuring and complaining? It didn't work so good for them. They murmured, and we know who this man's parents are, they said. Joseph is his father. How can he say, I came down from heaven? See, evidently, it was assumed that Joseph was the Lord's father, which, of course, made him a what? It made him an illegitimate child. If Joseph was his father, there's some problems, according to the law. Why? Because she had him outside of wedlock. And that's not good. So he knew they were thinking wrong anyways. The only way Jesus could describe his birth was to say he had come down from heaven, which he actually did. And the Jews, however, regarded such a claim as what? They regarded it as blasphemous. Because why? Watch this. They thought they knew him. And that may be you, friend. You may be here today and you say, you know, I know him. Do you really know him? Do you talk to him? You say, I talk to him all the time. How do you talk to him? Is he your daddy? Or is he someone that's just out there and something that's just, it's got to be in someone's imagination. I mean, because I really don't have a relationship with him. And I'm not plugged into him, and so... If I'm not plugged into him, I'm not going to rely on him. I'm not even going to ask what he thinks about anything. And so here he is. He's the bread of life. He's God himself in the flesh. God manifested in the flesh right in front of them. And they're murmuring. See, they used to murmur about him. Now they're murmuring to him. They get a little more bold as it comes along. And this week we see that what? It's the Jews that are murmuring at him and to him. And sadly, next week it'll be his disciples that'll what? They will take off. They'll say, see ya, I'm done with this. I'm done. I don't like this lamb-lion thing. I don't like this cross thing. I don't like this at all. And if that's what we got to be a part of, I'm out of here. And so as you read John 6... You got to place yourself in there and say, Where am I? Where am I with him? Am I complaining at him? Am I murmuring about what's going on in my own life because of him? Or am I just like the disciples and say, Hey, man, as long as you've got free food and you got the miracles going on here and some entertainment, I'm in. I'll be here all day, matinee all the way through. But as soon as that's done, I'm sorry. I'm done. I'm out of here. So the question is, what are you looking for when it comes to the bread of life? And it's not until you realize that what? It's not until we realize that we're lost that we can actually be found. This happens all the time today, and you know that. Because why? We have elderly people that get lost. And they have no idea where they're at. And they can't be found until what? Until somebody recognizes that they are lost. And fesses up and says, yes, I don't know where I'm at. I need help. Can you help me? That's one of the most wonderful things that we can do as individual humans before God is say, you know what? I don't know what in the world's going on. I need your help. But that flies in the face of all of our pride and all of who we are, because we don't have to, we don't like to ask anybody for anything. And we need him more than anything else. More than anything else. So he's addressing this, and he's saying, they're saying, hey, we know all about you. We think we know all about you. And you're just Joseph and Mary's. You, you're just his son. We, you can't be saying these things. Well, that's the preliminary reason, but look at the profounder reason, all right? The profounder reason for their murmuring is to be found in what he says about what? About his father, and what he says about his facts, and what he says about his flesh. 
So watch these. Number one, the matter of his father. The Lord picks up what he had just been saying privately to his disciples, and he repeats it for the benefit of his larger audience, including the newly arrived, highly suspicious, and critical religious leaders. Look at verse 43. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It's interesting that expression there at the end, at the last day, that expression is only found in the book of John, the Gospel of John. It's the only place you'll find it in the Bible. It's right there at that last day. Coming to Christ from the human side requires an action of human will. And from the divine side, it's an action of God's will. Do you see that in verse 44? No man can come to me except what? No man can come to me, that's the human will, except the divine will, the Father which has sent me, draw him. Draw him. The drawing power is God's love. Put forth in power, but not riding roughshod over anyone's will. Don't ever forget that. The fact is that the Father draws all people into the sphere of his love, though all do not respond. Those who do respond, they are regenerated, they're born again, and will be raised up by Christ at the last day for an eternity of bliss. But those who do not, they reject God. And they don't respond to that love. And some, most, don't, aren't so crude and say, hey, get out of my face, I don't need you. No, we're more slick than that. We just say, not right now. Not right now. Just not right now. I'm just not ready for that right now. I, watch this. I'm not ready right now because I don't understand everything. That's why it's called F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all, I trust him. So I have to forsake all and I have to trust him because why? Because that's who he is. He is an infinite God. And to have an infinite father... You must understand that we are finite in every matter, every way. We cannot understand everything. And so we must trust him by what? By faith. And we look at what? We look at who he is and what he said. Has he ever lied? No, he's never lied. You say, but I found you didn't find anything that he ever lied about. Because he never has. Because that's who he is. He's the very Son of God. He's God in human flesh. The Lord returns now from His God's will to God's Word. Look at that, verse 45 and 46. And He quotes a passage found in Isaiah 54, verse 13. He says this, And it is written in the prophets, what? And they shall all be taught of God. Has that ever happened yet? No, that's never happened yet. All right? Will it happen? Yes, it will. When? The millennial reign. You will see this. You will see this. The prophecy is directed to the restored city of Jerusalem. It's a kingdom age prophecy anticipating the millennial reign of Christ. That passage assures the people, all your children shall be taught by the Lord. That, of course, did not happen after the return from the Babylonian captivity. Although Ezra and the scribes, they did a heroic deed, they tried to teach everybody, but not everybody was taught. And they tried their best. Things so uh, soon began to worsen, calling for the ministry of who? Of Malachi. And by the time of Christ, those teachings had degenerated into what? Well, rabbinic traditions that effectively canceled the truth of the Word of God. The Lord here treats the prophecy as messianic being about the Messiah. And had the Jews accepted Christ, the promise of Isaiah would have been fulfilled. But since the Jews rejected Christ, the prophecy, uh, the prophecy was again postponed to what? Till the time of the millennium. And the Jews had mistakenly identified Joseph as the father of Jesus and made it the basis for their unbelief. 
And by this constant reference to God as his father, the Lord endeavored to set the record straight and also open a channel for belief. Now he adds this in verse 46. Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God, he has seen the Father. It's interesting, that second he there. He has seen the Father. That he is emphatic in the, in the original Greek. It's emphatic. Before his incarnation as the member of the triune Godhead, Jesus had seen the Father, and the Lord's words are as clear, claimed a deity and mark of the fact that he's becoming human, had not changed either his identity or his personality. The man, Jesus himself, mistakenly identified by the Jews as the son of Joseph, was the same one who had existed eternally as God the Son. And so you have the matter of his Father, but I want you to notice also the matter of his facts. The matter of his facts, because why? He has his facts correct. He tells them specifically and directly who he is. He conveyed to his, he's conveyed to his skeptical audience with fearless integrity. Facts, after all, are facts. And facts are stubborn things. In fact, they refuse to go away. Because why? It's the truth. And so the Lord first stated the basic fact. What is it? Verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. We can imagine the Jews shaking their heads over such an assertion. You see, the thing that blinded them was that they knew his family. Think about this. They knew the village where he had grown up. They know him as a schoolboy and as the village carpenter. They knew his mother. They knew his human brothers and sisters. They knew the house he had grown up in. Now he was running all over the country, stirring people up and making these statements they considered to be outrageous. But did they really know him? Be careful on what you and I think we know. We could be wrong. You say, hey, I evaluate, I see, I, I know where they're from, I know their dad and mom, and I know, I, know who, I know all about them. Do you? There's only one that knows everything about you. And watch this, it's not even you. It's him. You say, I know everything. Do you know where you were the third day of your birth? You say, man, that's ludicrous. You know what? It's not to him because he knows all about it. He knows everything about you. Does that frighten you? Does it make you a little unnerving that he knows everything about you? He not only knows that you're here, he knows why you're here. He knows everything about us. And he loves us. And he keeps telling us that. And he keeps showing you that. See, they thought they really knew him. And they knew all about him. But how could they account for his miracles? I mean, hey, I know Jesus. I know Joseph. I know Mary. I know all the brothers and sisters. But I'm having a hard problem figuring out how he's doing this. I'm really struggling with that. How in the world is he feeding all those people? How's he doing the miracles that you see and you hear about? I mean, we were there. We, we got to eat with, and we had plenty of food. And I had no idea where that came from. Somebody said it was some boy that had a couple of biscuits and, you know, just a few things. But what? I mean, it was good eating. How did he do that? No one's ever done that. So he's different. So how are we going to account for this? The Lord uses his verily, verily to affirm the sober truth of what he was saying. You remember some of them said he was mad. He was demon possessed. They talked about all kinds of things about him. Because why? Because they didn't know him. Then there was the broader fact in verse 48 and 50. Uh, the Lord brings them back to the great truth he's been proclaiming all along in this discussion. He, there, verse 48, he says, I am the bread of life. 
Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. Perhaps for the benefit of those who had recently joined the crowd, he reiterated what? His I am statement to be the bread of life. The bread which came down from heaven in the Old Testament did not ward off death. But he's saying, I am the bread of life, and if you take of this bread of life, you'll live forever. That's different. But what brought things to a head with his listeners was not the matter of his father and not the matter of the facts, but it was the matter of his flesh. His flesh. Wait a minute. This is weird. What you're talking about now is really weird. It's not if you use your noggin. Only if you make it weird. And watch this. Great many of people have made this weird. God didn't make it weird at all. So what's he saying? I am the living bread which came down from heaven... If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, let's just stop right there. Just stop right there and think about what's being said here. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, you honestly saying right now, the first thing coming in my mind, I've got to eat him. You say, that doesn't even make sense. Bingo, it doesn't. I'm glad you saw that. Because why? Because you're intelligent and you see that. The reason I'm being so blatant about this is because why? There is a whole religion built around this that believes this is literal. You say, wow, really? Yeah, it's called Roman Catholicism. And before you shut off and say, oh, no way, read their literature. Don't believe me. Now you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, you read their literature. Don't you believe me what I'm saying? I'm just telling you what they tell you and what is written in their dogmas. You say, really? Uh, yes, really. I, 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 I want you to see this. It is important to understand what the Lord means here by his flesh. Stay with me. If you think this is important, it'd be important to you, especially where you're at in your life. What does it mean by his flesh? It is not his literal body. Such a concept is absolutely ludicrous. His flesh is the metaphor he uses for his human nature, the totality of his life on the side of his humanity. The giving of his flesh is a reference to his sacrificial death, a death that's both voluntary. What did he say? He said, I will give. He said, I will give, and it's vicarious for the life of the world. I'm going to give my flesh. I'm going to give my life for everyone exactly what he did. That the Lord's reference to his flesh must be understood in this way is clear from what? From Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, where God speaks of our present unhindered access into his presence. Verse 19 and 20 says these words, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, by what? By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us, through what? Through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. By the blood of Christ, Jesus... I'm sorry, you can go back by the blood of Jesus and also by his flesh. So he's saying right here clearly, in this passage, the Lord's flesh is identified with the temple veil. And you know this, that veil represented all that Jesus was as God incarnate. It was a fine twined linen symbolizing his sinlessness and his righteousness. It was dyed blue, scarlet, and purple. Why? Had meaning to it. The blue symbolized his deity. He came from heaven. He was the son of God. The scarlet symbolized his humanity. 
He was the last Adam, the second Adam. You know the name Adam literally means red. The purple, something you learned in science a long time ago. Whenever you take equal amounts of blue and red and you mix them together, what do you always get? You get purple. What's the meaning of that? He's stating really obvious that Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. So the veil represented all that Jesus was and is as deity in humanity. He's making it very clear. The veil in both the temple as well as the tabernacle hung between the holy place where the priests ministered and the holy of holies where God was enthroned in the Shekinah glory cloud on the mercy seat between the cherubim. And that veil had one message. What was it? Keep out. It had one message. Don't you dare go in here. Who could go in? The high priest, how many times a year? Once. Everybody knew that. This is common knowledge. It wasn't something like, you may be here today, and you say, I had no idea. Why didn't somebody tell me? Growing up at that time, everybody knew that. They knew that. It was the day of atonement, at one month. That they would go in once. Who would go in? The high priest, not just any priest. It's the high priest that goes in once. He goes in in a very specific way. And you don't go in just however you want. You don't show up whenever you want and do whatever you want to do. You've got to do it what? God's way. Because why? Because God's way is always the perfect way. Anytime we ever take our way and say, hey, I'm going to do it my way, I'm sorry, it's not his way. His way is always perfect. His way. And he loves us. And he tells you, I want you in a specific way to do this. And if you will do it the way that I'm telling you, you will be blessed. If you don't, there will be consequences for the sin. And they're not good. The veil represented the flawless life of Jesus. And that life is our greatest indictment. It demonstrates that the life of sinless perfection, which God has every right to demand of us, and which we cannot live, has been lived out by, what? by who? By one man. That man, Christ Jesus. Thus that life condemns us. We know this, Romans chapter 8, verse 3. We read, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. You see, the greatest tragedy would have been for the Lord to come to earth and live a sinless life, set a perfect example before us, and then just bail and leave. He didn't do that. He came to set the example, and he rises again, and he says, Hey, you can accept me, and you can have my life living through you. So that what? So that every time Dad looks at you, he sees me, who's perfect in your stead. That's awesome. That's absolutely awesome. He took your place. He took my place. When no one else could, he did it. And friend, I can't tell you how much love he loves you. It's indescribable. And he's still calling out. He's still long-suffering. Not that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. He's still talking to you. He still wants a relationship with you and me. That's how much he loves us. You see, the lesson, if God left, that would have been an unrent veil. But because the veil was rent from top to bottom, he gives us the literal veil, and the temple was rent when Jesus died, opening the way into God's presence in the Holy of Holies. 
it was rent because the veil that is to say his flesh was rent upon what? Upon the cross for us. And when at last the Lord Jesus surrendered his life, when that veil was rent, everything that barred us from God was totally removed. And now we have access in. We have access into what? The Holy of Holies. To the only place that one person could go once a year. Now you and I have access all the time, 24-7, 365 days a year. He loves you and me. He really does. So go back to the verse. Go back to verse 51. The Lord Jesus said to the Jews, the bread that I will give him, pointing forward to his impending sacrifice at Calvary. The bread that I will give is my flesh, his unique and his sinless life as God manifests in the flesh. And then he says, which I will give. It's a repetition of all the important facts of his death for the life of the world, for the salvation of humankind in order to impart to human beings the life of God, eternal life itself. And what we have to do is what? We have to eat of this bread. That is personally take and appropriate the bread. Personally accept Christ into our lives as a deliberate, volitional act that we want to and we desire to. And now the opposition of the Jews broke out into the open. They were murmuring. It's no longer murmuring, but outright hostility. What's it based upon? Secondly, their misunderstanding. They murmur first, and then there's the misunderstanding. First of all, the problem. What is the problem? Verse 52 tells us, The Jews therefore strove, they argued among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They did not recognize that he again was using the figure of speech. I want to teach you something here. And you say, man, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's all right. If you take a picture of this, you'll kind of know what's going on. You'll be on the inside scoop. Take a little seminary class right now, all right? So right here it is. They did not recognize that he was using a figure of speech. What's the figure of speech? Well, the figure of speech is the word sunik duke. Sunik duke. Sunik duke. That's that word. You say, what in the world is that? Well, it's a specific part of something in which a specific part of something is used to refer to the whole thing. We use this all the time. Here's some examples I gave you. When you offer your hand in marriage, do you just offer your hand and that's all? With thee I wed, here's my hand. Slice it, dice it, take it with you, and I'm out of here. No, we give what? Our whole self, but what are we saying? We give our hand. Hey, what do you do in mouths, in hungry mouths to feed? Are you just feeding the mouth? No, you're feeding the whole body. You're given food so the whole body will have it. Here's one we use. Hey, man, you got some nice looking wheels. Are you just really talking about my wheels? Or No, I'm talking about the whole car. You know, your Corvette's really cool, Peter. You know, I mean, it's a cool thing. It's orange. Man, I love the wheels. No, I love the car. We use this all the time. And, you know, we laugh about it because, like, oh, that's common knowledge. Everybody knows that. Well, sadly, not everybody knows that. Flesh here is used for the Lord himself. We can also view it as a metaphor where one thing is declared to be something else. Both are common figures of speech in Scripture and also in everyday life. To take a figure of speech or to take what is literal as a figure of speech is a common error in Bible interpretation. You see, the, the Jews objected to grasp the fact that the Lord was using a figure of speech and concluded that he was suggesting some form of cannibalism, the literal eating of his flesh. And so that was the problem, but then the Lord just expanded the proclamation. He expanded the proclamation. What's he say? He says this, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. 
And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. You say, wow, that, that sounds like well, i got to eat his flesh. It sounds like it, but it's not you eat his flesh. It's not literal. It's a figure of speech. The Roman Catholic Church has used these verses to formulate its dogma known as transubstantiation. You say, really? Yes, really. That dogma claims that eating the flesh and drinking the blood of the Lord means to partake of his real body and blood in the Holy Communion. You say, nobody believes that. Everybody that is a practicing Catholic and serious about it has to believe it. Why? Because it's a dogma of their church. What is clearly a figure of speech is taken as literal. It's evident that the coming and believing of verse 35... You see verse 35 there. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. The coming and believing is the same as the eating and drinking of verse 51 and verse 54. It's the same thing. He's not making this complicated. It's the same thing. And when we come to Christ and believe in him, we receive in our, our souls the benefits of his body and blood offered us on the cross of Calvary. Quite apart from the fact that John 6 has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper. Why is that? Because that hasn't happened yet. In fact, that won't happen until Matthew chapter 26. You see, his crucifixion was not yet, and the Lord's teaching in John 6 is figurative throughout and cannot be used to support Catholic dogmas. It can't be. The Jews used the expression, eat and drink, in a figurative way to denote the operation of the mind in receiving and inwardly digesting truth. You see this in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. You also see this in Jeremiah 15, 16. It's just common figures of speech. And were figures of speech used in the, in the Bible? Yes, they were. We speak of people devouring a book or chewing on a piece of information or swallowing an outrageous lie. To take an obvious figure of speech as literal and then to build a doctrine on that literal interpretation, it's a travesty. It's a travesty of spiritual truth. The theory accepted as dogma is that the bread and wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ. That's exactly what Roman Catholicism teaches. It is an attempt to explain the statements of Christ in both Mark chapter 14, verse 22, and also Mark chapter 14, verse 24, where he says, this is my bod, a body and this is my blood. This is my body and this is my blood. Rome insists that the word is must be taken literally. And the devout Catholic believes that the wafer has ceased to be a wafer. It may still look and taste like a wafer. It may mold like a wafer, but it is no longer a wafer. And so the Jews who first heard the Lord give this teaching were likewise inexcusable in their misunderstanding. The Lord... However, ignored their mistake. He gave a final summary. What did he say? This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. It says almost the Lord said, take it or leave it. The time had come to begin what? To been separating the chaff from the wheat. Those who were real and those who were not real. And you see this in John 6. Not only the outsiders, but we'll see next week, Lord willing, the insiders. Those that are his disciples. And when I say that, some people just think, well, yeah, those 12 disciples? How many disciples did he have? Thousands of disciples. Thousands of disciples. So make sure in context, don't get this wrong. It's just not the 12 and that's it. No, he had thousands of disciples who said what? 
They said, we're out of Dodge. We'll see this next week. We're out of here. We're gone. Verse 66 in the text. We're out of here. We're done. And they never came back. They never came back. And so the question is, is he really telling the truth here? Yes, he is. And this turning point in the ministry of the Lord was so important that John mentions it. In letter C, we call it the place. What's the place? The place is called Capernaum. It's actually the village of Nahum, is what it literally interprets to. But this city had become his Galilean headquarters, and it would be from then on. That became his home place. And there he now made his home, and there too he performed many of his miracles including the healing of a servant of that Roman centurion who had built a synagogue for the Jews in Capernaum. You see this in Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. He builds a synagogue for him, and he heals them. I mean, he, he does a miracle. To what? He had a servant that was dying. He said, not a problem. I'll heal him. And you remember he said, man, I haven't seen anything like this. you different than most. Because Why? I don't even have to go there. You believe. And this was a Roman centurion. Who's the Roman centurion? Oh, just the enemies of all the Jews. J just the enemy. The, the, the greatest enemy of all the Jews was a Roman, and he was a centurion. What did he do? He is a commander over other Roman soldiers. So they didn't like him at all. And what did Jesus do? always told the facts. Hey, folks, you better learn to listen to him. Because why? He's got more faith than anybody I've ever seen around here. And he's the one you all hate. He's the one you all want to destroy. And you want me to destroy him. When he actually comes to me, not murmuring, not saying anything negative, he's just saying, hey, I know and I've heard about you, and I believe that you can do this. And you don't even need to go to my house. You can do it right here. So he had the faith. How about you? Do you have the faith? You say, well, I'm a disciple. Are you? Are you a born-again disciple? Do you really believe in him? Has there been a point in time in your life where you have said... God, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and you're the only Savior that there is. I believe that you went to the cross and you died for my sins. I truly believe that, Lord. And I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins, and I've committed a whole bunch of them, and you know that. And God, as you bring them to my mind, I confess them to you. That yes, I'm sorry, I did that. I was wicked, and I still am wicked now. And I'm in need of you. And you alone can save me. God, will you come into my life and save me? And help me to live for you from day until the day I die. Thank you. I love you. Thank you for your kindness. If you've never done that, not those exact words, but if you've never had an attitude like that and done that and asked him to come into your life, I just want to let you know, you've never been born again. Everyone that's been born again has admitted to him that they're a sinner in need of a Savior. And you have to do that. He said, I don't believe that. I'll do that later. I'll do that when I'm ready. So you're willing to gamble. Watch this that nobody out there would dare kill you between now and the time you're going to receive him. If you watch the news at all, you're familiar every single day people die and go into eternity. And you're also very familiar with a lot of people had no idea when they woke up that morning that they were going to be in eternity by the end of the day. Because why? Because somebody, and usually it's some sinner who wants to do his or her own thing, they happen 
or you happen to get in their way. And an accident or a blatant killing occurs. And people wake up in eternity and had no idea that it would happen that fast. You say, you trying to scare me? Yes. Why? Because there's a reality on the end of the scare. What is it? There's a reality of a place called hell. By the way, heaven could never be real if hell's not real. And hell could never be real if heaven's not real. Because why? Because the word of God uses the same words, eternal damnation and eternal life, equally the same. And you can't have one without the other. And so God is saying to you once again today, on this Palm Sunday, he's saying, will you receive me? Will you receive me? And I'll be your Lord and Savior. I encourage you. Don't walk away without him. Secondly, to all of us who receive Christ as our Savior, how is your walk with him? Only you and him know. But I do know from his word, he wants every one of us to be plugged into him, to be communicating with him, and to be living for him. Every, watch this, moment of our life. And that's very convicting. But it also can be very joyful if we give ourselves to him and allow him to live his life through us. So wherever you're at today, take the next step. Say, hey, I'm right here. Take the next step. Lord, evaluate my life. Is there anything in my life that's not pleasing to you? And immediately things will start coming to your mind. Confess your mess. Just confess that. So you're exactly right, and you've shown me. Thank you for being so kind and showing me what I need to do to make sure that my life with you is free of sin. And I'm going to live my life for you. It's not complicated at all. It's very simple. So I encourage you. Don't resent, don't resent the bread of life message. Rejoice in it. Take it, eat it, meditate upon it, and live it in your life. Amen.